and welcome to our Bible class online. And today we're going to, our scripture reading is going to be taken from 1 Kings uh, chapter 18 and we're going to be reading from verse 17 down to the end of verse 40. I trust that you'll follow with us. <clears throat> and it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us uh, two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first. For ye are many, and call on the name of your gods but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called in the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is on a journey. Or peradventure he sleepeth, and must be awakened. And they cried aloud, and cut themselves after their manner, with knives and lancets, till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass, when midday was past, and, the, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. And Elijah sent, said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass, at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near, and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and slew them there. Amen. And trust the Lord to bless that reading to our hearts. Okay, uh, this is a very interesting story, and I'm, I trust that most people maybe are familiar with the story of Elijah and the great challenge that he brought to the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And uh, it's you know um, Elijah had a great 
uh, conquest here on Mount Carmel and it was a great victory for the Lord and I just want to illustrate through this passage that you and I both can have great uh, victories in, in God as well and we can have the mountaintop experiences as well and uh, but just to bring you up to speed just on the story uh, prior to uh, us cutting in a verse 17 Elijah had previously prayed to God that God would bring a famine upon the land uh, and uh, more specifically uh, that he would withhold the rain uh, there'll be drought for about three and a half years and the reason why he did this was uh, because uh, King Ahab and Jezebel were two very wicked people in fact they were Baal worshippers and they built groves onto their their god and it was a very wicked thing to do and uh, so this is the reason why Elijah had prayed that there would be uh, a drought for three and a half years to try and bring God's judgment down upon Ahab and upon Jezebel. Okay, so it says uh, in James chapter 5 and the verse 17, it says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. <clears throat> so we know that, that Elijah had prayed specific prayers that it wouldn't rain and God answered that prayer and you know how God you know how the story went how God looked after Elijah he fed him by ravens by the brook uh, Cherith and that God uh, preserved and kept Elijah and uh, so now we're in a situation where Ahab is currently looking uh, for Elijah because Ahab is pretty distraught at this stage because the famine the Bible tells us was extremely sore in this land of Samaria, which which was uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, and uh, yeah, the famine was, was greatly sore. So, uh, King Ahab was out trying to find Elijah, and the Bible tells us that he couldn't find him. In fact, he sent his uh, his servant Obadiah out as well. Obadiah went one direction, and Elijah went in another direction, and they couldn't find him. We read that in verse ten here. It says, "As the Lord thy God liveth." There is no nation or kingdom whether my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not here, uh, he took an oath for the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. So I mean he went through all these different nations and all these different places, but yet they couldn't find Elijah anywhere. And they were seeking Elijah because they wanted to blame Elijah. In fact, they were blaming Elijah for this current situation. It was Elijah's fault that it, uh, there was no rain uh, during this particular time. But Obadiah actually came across Elijah and Obadiah met up with Elijah and Ahab, or Elijah had said to Obadiah, go and tell Ahab that you have seen me and bring him to me. Okay, and we find this, uh, we picked up this in verse 17 and it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, art thou he that troubleth Israel? Art thou he that troubleth Israel? So notice the accusation straight away whenever Ahab meets up with, with uh, Elijah, how he blames him for this severe famine. And it's, you know, it's typical of, of sinful people to want to blame their pastor for the trouble. You know, it's, it's, a, bit, it's a wee bit like uh, uh, blaming the postman for, uh, for bringing bills. I mean, we often hear the saying, don't shoot the messenger. Well, that's exactly what King Ahab was doing here with Elijah. He was basically shooting the messenger. I mean, it was God's command uh, you know that that it was God's commandments that Elijah was upholding, but it was it was God's commandments that Elijah was disobeying, and uh, so uh, and this this kind of maybe uh, I mean absolutely it wasn't Elijah's fault, by no stretch of the imagination. It is most certainly not Elijah's fault that it didn't rain. Now yes, Elijah prayed that there would be no rain, but that doesn't make it his fault. Okay, King Ahab. Uh, the reason King Ahab needs to look in the mirror of God's word and he needs to realize and understand that he is the one in, in an actual fact and I love Elijah's response to this here because Elijah's response in verse 18 and says and he answered I have not troubled Israel but thou and thy father's house in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and thou hast followed Balaam so here's the problem right here in verse 18 the fact that Ahab wasn't following God's commandments but in fact he was following Balaam which is none other than Satan <clears throat> so 
Uh, but notice, notice uh, Elijah's response in verse 18. Uh, he just points the finger right back at uh, Ahab and uh, but thou and thy father's house. And this is where Elijah now brings the challenge to Ahab and to the prophets of Baal to meet him at Mount Carmel. If you look just with us at verse 21, and it says, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. That's a wonderful question. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Elijah was trying to explain to Israel, you can't be on the fence. You can't be dabbling in Christianity and dabbling in the world at the same time. It's time to choose one or the other. And you know, people do this all the time. This kind of thing happens even today. You know, people believe in God and they go to church. Maybe they only go to church occasionally, hatches, matches and dispatches. And people are halting between two opinions. Oh, I don't like that Christianity. I'd have to give up this way of life or something like that. You know what the Bible tells me in Mark chapter 8 and the verse 36 it says for what shall a profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Okay looking at verses 22 here it says then Elijah then said Elijah unto the, unto the people I even I only remain a prophet of the Lord but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. So here's the challenge that Elijah's bringing to these prophets of Baal. Elijah's a little tired of them, uh, halting between two opinions. So he brings this challenge to them, to meet them up on Mount Carmel. And that they were all going to take a sacrifice. And whichever God, whichever God answered by fire was the true and living God. So Elijah, like many people who take a stand for the Lord, probably felt a little alone at this time. I mean, notice what it said in verse 22, that Elijah, then said Elijah unto the people, I even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. And quite often when you take a stand for the God, for, for God, you can you can feel very much alone. You can feel as though maybe nobody else agrees with you. You know, and the devil would try to make you feel like that. He would try to make you feel that well you're the only one that has this opinion. But look, there's four hundred and fifty people who have a different opinion than you. But this is the time where you've got to stand strong. And your faith has got to be uh, rested and founded upon God and upon his word. I mean, Elijah's faith here was great. It was great. But isn't it, isn't it powerful how the devil would make you feel that you're the only one that thinks this way? Uh, and maybe Elijah was going through that right now. But I'm glad that he stood strong and he stood firm in his beliefs because it paid off. But there was 450 of these prophets of Baal. But when you know the truth of God and you have on the breastplate of righteousness, you can stand with boldness just like Elijah. And Elijah brought this challenge to these false prophets. So both of them were to build an altar unto the Lord and to lay on a bullock upon this altar. And the challenge was that they were not to put any fire on it, but that was they were to call upon their God to bring the fire. So we look at verse 24, it says, And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. The God that answereth by fire, let him be God. So Elijah kindly let the prophets of Baal go first. And the Bible says in verse uh, 26, it says, And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called in the name of Baal from morning even until evening, saying, Baal, O Baal, hear us. But none did hear. I love the bit when, when Elijah starts to mock the prophets of Baal. Uh, and maybe you think that that's, that's a little, um, we shouldn't be doing, doing, doing them sort of things. But it just the sarcasm that Elijah was using here, it, it makes me laugh. But uh, I find it very interesting. It, it says uh, in the verse 27, And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them 
and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. He is maybe talking, or he is pursuing, or he is on a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. Okay, so Elijah is kind of having a bit of fun with us here because Elijah is standing back and he knows that they're worshipping false gods. And Elijah knows the truth. And that's why he can stand there with boldness and mock these prophets of Baal. And these, these prophets of Baal were very, very serious, very, very devout to, the, to their cause and very religious people. And the Bible even tells us here in the verse 28 that they were cutting themselves and throwing themselves even upon the altar to try and get Baal's attention. But you can, you can sense the sarcasm through this passage on Elijah's voice, and I think it's very remarkable. But in verse 28, it tells us that they were, you know, and they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. It says they're after their manner. So obviously this was a custom to them. This was something that they'd done in their religious practices. They were cutting themselves, and the, the blood was gushing out of them all over this sacrifice. These men were serious. These, these men were really, really devout and serious about their religion. Very, very serious. And you know, you, you find out as you read through scripture that, that, and even today, that most of these devil worshippers, these Baal worshippers, they're all involved in this practice of cutting themselves. And in fact, they, they, they probably love death as well. I mean, think about the story that we brought last, that I brought last week about the demonic man from Gadara and how he was uh, cutting himself and that he lived uh, in, in the graveyard, basically. He, he, lived, he dwelt among the tombs. And he was cutting himself as well. So this seems to be something that's associated with, with devil worship, uh, is cutting themselves. So there's something we must understand when it comes to this kind of worship, this Baal worship and the worship of idols and things like that. Idolatry and the worship of idols, uh, you know, it's a, it's a statue. They see not, neither do they hear, and they certainly can't walk. But when it comes to Baal worship, and these were prophets of Baal, this is outright satanic worship. This is worship of Satan himself. I mean, when you read through scripture, there's many terms for this kind of worship. I mean, the Bible talks about uh, Baal. It talks about Beelzebub. And it, uh, Beelzebub being the prince of devils. It talks about Balaam and Belial uh, and terms like that, which we find throughout scripture. I mean, these are all references to Satan. This, this is Satan worship. Okay, This isn't just necessar necessarily uh, idolatry or worshipping statues. Okay, This is actually worshipping uh, Satan himself. And be rest assured that they have probably seen some miraculous things that have been done by Satan. And this is why they're so devout. Because they believe him to be some sort of mystical power. And uh, they are really devout followers of Satan. And, and that does happen today. There's nothing new under the sun. And you know we know that Satan can do powers and, and show signs and wonders and things like that there. In fact, he's not done yet. When, when we read through the book of the Bible, and especially, more specifically, the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 13, the Bible tells us something that's going to happen in the future. That uh, the devil is going to perform some uh, signs and wonders. Just listen to this here. In Revelation 13, and from the verse 11, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast, beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell in the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So there we see something that's going to happen by none other than Satan himself uh, in the book of Revelation, which is, is the, the time period of tribulation, which, which we're probably not that far away from. What we see is that the devil is going to actually imitate what actually happened here in Mount Carmel, where he literally can bring fire down from, from heaven. And, you know, don't underestimate the power that Satan has. You and I can't stand against it. Uh, and, don't be, and don't be fooled or deceived into thinking that, that the devil doesn't have any powers. He does. And we need to be careful that we don't get mixed up or involved with it. We need to stay away from uh, works of darkness uh, because they have no fellowship with the things of God. 
So we need to be extremely careful about that. Now it's Elijah's turn now in the story now to prove that, uh, that God is the all-powerful, almighty God. Uh, and you know, in verse 30, uh, And Elijah said unto the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Okay, so Elijah calls all the people over to him. It's Elijah's turn now. And Elijah calls all the people over to him. And the first thing we notice in verse 30 here is that Elijah repairs uh, or builds up the broken down altar. Uh, I mean, after years of neglect, this altar got into disrepair. Years of not being used, this altar gets broken down. And the first thing that we read about in verse 30 here is that Elijah brings the people close to him and then he must repair the altar of the Lord that was broken down. You know, in, in order to do something great for the Lord, we need to build up the things that's broken down in our lives. And you know, you, you can do great things for the Lord, just like Elijah did. Now maybe you, you'll not be bringing fire down from heaven or anything like that there. But you know, you can have great mountaintop victories as well. But you have to do the same as what Elijah did first. We've got to repair that which is broken. And maybe, maybe there's things broken in your life. I, I understand that we don't have physical altars today. And we're not doing animal sacrifices and things like that. Because Jesus Christ ultimately is our sacrifice. But maybe there's things in your life that are, are broken down, metaphorically speaking, and need to be built up again. And maybe you once went to church three times a week, maybe Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Thursday night, and maybe you're barely going to church now maybe once a week. So maybe you need to build that up again. Or maybe maybe you're a person that used to read your Bible every day. Maybe you're a person that maybe read five chapters a day. But now the Bible's barely opened. Maybe that needs to be built up again in your life. We need to get our, ourselves right with God. We need to get these things built up again. Or perhaps maybe you were like Daniel, who prayed daily three times. And you know, maybe you're barely praying at all now. I don't know, we need to judge ourselves according to these things. But there, there's, there's areas in all of our lives that we could build up again. Uh, we, need to, we need to make sure that we're standing right before God and living the way that God wants us to live. You know, so Elijah recognised that th there was something that needed to be built up again in order to, to come before God. So Elijah proceeds to build this altar and he uses 12 stones, which obviously represent uh, the, the 12 tribes of, of, of Israel. And if you notice there in verse, uh, verses 33 and 34, it says, And put, and he put on the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill your barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And he did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And he did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar, and filled the trench also with water. Now notice uh, that Elijah is dosing this thing in water. Twelve barrels of water, in fact, was used to dose this thing, this altar, and fill the trench round about the altar as well. And maybe twelve barrels, I don't know, maybe it represents the twelve stones, the twelve tribes of Israel. Not sure why you use twelve, but why use water in the first place? Well, it's very interesting because I, I personally believe that uh, Elijah didn't want any credit at all for this uh, miraculous event that was about to unfold on Mount Carmel. I believe that Elijah uh, wanted all the praise and all the glory to go to God and he wanted to eliminate any possibility that anybody would have thought that it might have been him. And I'm pretty sure that Elijah would have been standing well back from this altar after he had dosed it with water and before he started to pray unto the Lord for fire. I'm pretty sure that he would have got everybody well back because I'm sure Elijah was expecting great things here. But also that he wanted to eliminate any possibility that it was him that somehow started the fire. So he was trying, I believe that that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to eliminate and make this a more miraculous uh, event whenever God did strike it with fire. And then, and then the Bible, Bible tells us that Elijah cried unto God. And I would have loved to have heard that prayer, but the Bible gives us the words of that prayer. And in fact, there's, there's 63 words used in this prayer. Listen to the words of the prayer that Elijah prayed. And it's found there in the verse uh, 30, 
uh, 36. And it came to pass at the time of the evening, or the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham and Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. 63 words. Short. But you know something? Very powerful words. The Bible tells us in James chapter 5 and the verse 16, it says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. This, this describes Elijah. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And what happened? God rained fire. And you know, it didn't take a long prayer to get that fire to come down from heaven. Very short prayer, 63 words. And you know, uh, it, just, it just makes me think, because Jesus actually rebuked uh, the scribes in, in Luke chapter 20, in the verse 47. He, he rebuked them for their long prayers and said it was just for a show. I believe that long prayers need to be kept to the closet. And you can pray as long as you want in the closet. But when we're in public, I, I think the prayers need to be fervent and effectual and uh, short okay and you know Elijah was in a, in a very public place here and he kept his prayer short he wasn't long-winded and he wasn't going down deep and staying down long and coming up dry or anything like that it was short it was to the point and it was fervent and very effectual and God answered that prayer with literal fire I love when it says that in verse 38 then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and even licked up the water that was in the trench. What a sight. I'd have loved to have seen that. What an amazing sight. Just to see the, the very stones being burnt and turning to dust. This water that was in the trench just been licked up with the fire of the Lord. What an amazing thing. And all the, all the praise and all the glory was going to God, not to Elijah. I mean, obviously, Elijah didn't want anybody to think that he was some sort of magician or wizard or something like that, that, that he was able to do this. He wanted all the praise and all the glory to go to God for this miraculous event. And the fire of the Lord came down, licked up the water. This, this was a, an absolute victory for the people of God, for Elijah. And again, you can have that victory. Maybe we'll not call down fire from heaven. But we can have the mountaintop experience. We can have uh, these kind of uh, mountaintop experiences just like Elijah uh, experienced this victory in our lives. And we all need a bit of that. And, you know, uh, how you, you know, how do you get your prayer life answered? I mean, how is your prayer life? Because Elijah's prayers were very effectual. And God answered with fire. And we want our prayers to be answered in a similar way. Maybe not with fire, but... Uh, we, like Elijah, need to make sure that we're walking with God, first of all. And having our prayers answered is very conditional. Because the Bible tells us in Psalm uh, chapter 66, on the verse 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. So we need to make sure that our heart is right before God. And that we're walking right before God. And we've built up those things which are, are broken down in our lives. And making sure that we're walking uh, in accordance to God's will in order to get our prayers answered. And here's another aspect to that. If we're not praying at all, how do you expect to get your prayers answered? The Bible tells us in James chapter 4 verse 2, Ye have not, because ye ask not. We are praying. But then in verse 3 of James 4 it tells us that ye receive not, because ye ask amiss. So that you're consuming it upon your lust. I mean, maybe you're asking for things from God that you're consuming upon your lust. I mean, we just can't get down on our knees and ask God for uh, a fancy car or, or loads of money or whatever. God will give you what you need, but not necessarily what you want. Then finally, uh, look at verse 40. The Bible tells us, And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Wow, 450 prophets of Baal, Elijah took down to this brook Kishon and slew them. 
you know, Elijah was no snow, snowflake. Elijah is a, a pretty heroic man, a pretty valiant man. It just amazes me that, that he was able to do this, to slay 450 of the prophets of Baal. You know, maybe, maybe you're sitting there thinking to yourself, well, why didn't he get them saved? Why didn't he preach the gospel to them? I mean, at this point in verse 39, it tells us, uh, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And obviously these prophets of Baal seen that the Lord is God. I mean, the Lord God was the one that answered by fire. So I'm sure at this point, they know who the real God is. So why didn't Elijah just get them saved? Why didn't he preach the gospel to them and get them saved? And, and uh, why did he have to take them down to this brook and slay them? What I want you to understand is that these are prophets of Baal. And that these prophets of Baal were sons of the devil. And there's no hope for such people like that. They're reprobate. Meaning that God has rejected, re rejected these people. They had their opportunity of getting saved, but they made a lot of bad choices in their lives. And they've now chosen to become Satan worshippers. And when, the, when you're rejected by God, you're done. They had their opportunity, but have rejected. Sons of Belial. I trust that this has been a blessing to you. Uh, I need to end it there. Uh, there's so much more we could have said. And you know, again, we all have, we all can have these mountaintop experiences like Elijah. Uh, and if you, if you can remember the story that happened after this here, how Elijah had come off the mountaintop, he went into a very heavy state of depression, and and because Jezebel wanted to slay him, and Elijah fled after this. So obviously, after a mountaintop experience. Like what Elijah had, there's also going to be the valleys. There's going to be the downside of that. Um, there's going to be the depression. So we need to be, we need, we need to keep a fine balance in these things. We need to understand that there is highs and lows in life. And whenever there's victories, there's also going to be the the tribulation, and we need to be uh, ready for that. So I trust that this has been a blessing for you, and I trust maybe that you could apply some of these things even to your own lives and uh, that make the changes and build up those things that are broken down in our own lives. Thanks for listening. Let's have a word of prayer just before we finish. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we give thee thanks and praise for your precious word. We thank you for the precious word of God and for the mountaintop experiences that Elijah had. We pray, dear God, for these mountaintop experiences even in our own lives and that you'd help us, dear God, each and every one, uh, to build up those things that are broken down in our own lives. And Lord, we just pray through these times that you'll bless us and keep us all safe. And Lord, we look forward to meeting up again uh, and, and being able to praise and worship together as, as believers in Christ. So bless us, we pray in Jesus' precious most holy name. Amen.